family and friends welcome to the eighth Sunday after Pentecost I hope that uh, everyone's staying healthy and safe I know the numbers in our at least our county Ori County are staying about the same but it's no time to relax we need to continue to stay home if we're not feeling well enjoy the service uh, join the service actually at home with family and friends our home Eucharist continues to go out and lastly just a reminder that we are meeting Wednesdays at noon for Eucharist and healing prayer so if you're still interested in coming into the building but a little worried about crowds Maybe think about joining us on Wednesdays at noon. Our service this morning begins on page 123 in the Book of Common Prayer with an opening acclamation. Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Join me in saying the Collect for Purity on top of page 124. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy. Christ, Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Join me in saying the glory to God on top of page 125. Glory to God in Christ, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son and Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, and the glory of God and Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we to pray, and to give more than we either desire or deserve. Pour down upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us those things of which our conscience is afraid, and giving us those good things for which we are not worthy to ask, 
except through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for the reading of God's Word. A reading from the book of 1 Kings, chapter 3, beginning at verse 3. Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of David his father, only he sacrificed and made offerings at the high places. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give you. And Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant David my father, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart towards you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love, and have given him a son to sit on his throne this day. And now, O oh Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of David my father, although I am but a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in, and your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too many to be numbered or counted for multitude. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil, for who is able to govern this great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this, and God said to him, Because you have asked this, and have not asked for yourself long life, or riches, or the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right. Behold, I now do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind, so that none like you has been before, and none like you shall arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that no other king shall compare with you all your days. And if you will walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments, as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us read Psalm 119, found on page 436, from verse 121 through verse 136, responsively by half verse. I have done that which is lawful and right. Oh, give me not over to my oppressors. Be surety for your servants good. Oh, let not the arrogant oppress me. My eyes have wasted away with looking for your salvation. And for the word of your righteousness. Oh, deal with your servant according to your loving mercy. And teach me your statutes. I am your servant. Oh, grant me understanding. That I may know your testimonies. It is time for you, O oh Lord, to act. For they have broken with your law. For I love your commandments above all things. More than no old precious stones. Therefore, I hold all your commandments to be right. And all false ways I utterly adore. Your testimonies are wonderful. Therefore, does my soul keep them. When your word goes forth, it gives light. And understanding to the simple. I opened my mouth and drew in my breath. For my delight was in your commandments. Oh, look upon me and be merciful unto me. Attend your holy to those who love your name. Order my steps according to your word. And so shall no wickedness have dominion over me. Oh, deliver me from those who deal wrongfully. And so shall I keep your commandments. Show the light of your countenance upon your servant. And teach me your statutes. My eyes gush out water. Because of those who do not keep your law. Glory, Glory be to the, to the Father, Father and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, 
as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. A reading from the book of Romans, chapter 8, beginning at verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the reading of our Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew. Lord, to you, Lord Christ. Jesus put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who, on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. And when it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you. Pray with me, please. Lord, let the words of my mouth, the meditation of all of our hearts, be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, good morning, and I confess that as I was listening uh, to Brooks uh, read the lessons so beautifully this morning, um, I wanted to shift the way the sermon was going, and then Ryan read the gospel and got to that part about um, the last parable about the net and how Jesus relates that to the kingdom of God. And I thought about all the shrimpers and fishermen around here and thought, man, oh man, next time this comes around, I'm gonna talk about the net that hauls in everything off the sandy bottom around here, that hauls in the old tires, uh, the old anchors, all the broken wood and things that are left on the bottom along with the fish that are alive. That parable, and this has very little to do with my sermon, is about who's alive and who's dead, um, more than it's about who gets judged in the end. The dead will be thrown aside, the alive will be welcomed into the kingdom. So hang on to that, and coming soon, 
Prince George will preach on that particular parable. This morning, I want to talk about wisdom. I just hadn't thought about it. No surprise for those of you that are getting to know me. Wisdom is not something I think about too often. And that was kind of where I started. How often do we think about what the word wisdom means? And that led me to the question of whose wisdom or what wisdom are we relying on to get us through this life, especially in pandemic times? Whose wisdom are we relying on? How are we being led through life? All of that came to the forefront this week for me when someone came to my office Monday and wanted to speak with me. And as we spoke and as we talked, uh, I looked at the person and said, well, for a second, just relate to me what difference your salvation moment has made in your life or has made in the rest of your life. How does your moment of salvation bear on the rest of your life? What I was trying to do was remind the person that the moment of our salvation, at the moment we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, which could be for some as a child. My wife would say that's her story. It could be for others that they were in youth group, they were on a youth retreat, as my daughter would say. Or it could be for some of us as desperate and convicted adults. That's me and many other men that I know, desperate and convicted of my sin. But that moment is supposed to have implications on our lives. First, there's the implication of the moment. We come to grips with our sin and who we are and who our holy God is, and we fall to our knees, either metaphorically or physically, and we say, my Lord and my God, forgive me. Once that happens, once that exchange takes place, then our salvation is supposed to have an effect on the rest of our earthly lives. And finally, it has an effect for eternity. But make no mistake, our moment of salvation is a three-step process. It's not something that happened a long time ago. We've been given a credit, and someday when we die, we're going to cash that in. No. If Scripture is clear, when we are led to repent, we are forgiven by grace and set free so that we can be filled with God's Holy Spirit, Scripture tells us, to do good works. So that was my question to the person in my office. It was my way of reminding him what Paul seems to be reminding us constantly in Romans. Our salvation and being filled by the Holy Spirit should be causing us to behave and even look like, and I love this word and it's in the Bible, peculiar people. Peculiar people. I'll explain that later. But do we? Do we occasionally? Do we ever act or look peculiar? I mean like sports fans face painting peculiar. You know those people that go to the games and they've painted their faces to match the color of the team? That kind of peculiar. Or maybe a little closer to home, like people who would put sports decals for their favorite team all over their car. That kind of peculiar. You know when people from Africa come, one of the things they're most taken by is all of the decals we put on our cars. What do they mean? What do they signify? It's, it's, it's interesting that we would do that and not think that was peculiar. But do we ever make those around us or people we work with question our motives. Because the key to our motives is this. The key to our motives comes from an internal investigation. Are we being motivated by everything or something outside of ourselves? Or is our motivation constantly coming from inside of ourselves? Isaiah in chapter 47 warns us, warns the world about internal motivation. Isaiah 47.10 you felt secure in your wickedness. In other words, if we're being motivated internally, there's something wicked that's coming out of us. You said, no one sees me. Have you ever done that when you're sinning? You ever decided, well, this isn't hurting anybody. I'm all by myself. No one sees what's going on. Isaiah warns us, your wisdom and your knowledge leads you astray. And you said in your heart, and listen to this, you said in your heart, we say in our hearts, I am, and there is no one besides me. We say, I am. There is only one I am, and he is the Lord God Almighty. He tells Moses that when Moses says, who do I tell them is sending me? God says, tell them I am. Do you see how deep that warning is from Isaiah? When we claim to be the leaders of our lives, when we claim to be the power that directs us, we're essentially claiming to be God, I am, and there is no one besides me. I know those are tough words, but they highlight a problem, and they get us back to that question, who or what is leading us? Because 
as Isaiah says, the scripture is clear. If we're being led by anything other than the will and the spirit of God, then we're being led in the wrong direction, brothers and sisters. We're actually behaving and acting like the rest of the world. By the way, and scripture points this out repeatedly, that way is always at odds with the plan of God. But how do we know we're headed in the right direction or for the sake of this sermon, how do we know we're being led in wisdom or being led by the Spirit of God? Well, that's an easy question to answer. Biblically speaking, we would occasionally exhibit supernatural or rare qualities in this life that make others look at us and go, huh? Why'd they do that? In other words, here's a list. Does our life or vocabulary sound like this? Are we being given prophetic words in proportion to our faith? If we're serving, who are we serving? This is Paul's letter in the Romans a little further down. The one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor. There's a short list of how to act peculiar, or what, I would say, the Holy Spirit does in us to make us act peculiar. He nudges us to teach. He nudges us to contribute. He nudges us to take positions of leadership in the church and lead with zeal. He nudges us into acts of mercy with cheerfulness. With cheerfulness. He nudges us to love one another. Or maybe we see ourselves in a list like this. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If we notice those things in our life, or if other people have mentioned that they see those things in us in our life, then I would say we're walking in step with the Spirit, or we're beginning to walk in step with the Spirit. If not, then we have to pause and ask ourselves, what are we doing with the wisdom we've been given? Proverbs 24, 14. Know that wisdom is such to your soul. If you find it, there will be a future, and your hope will not be cut off. If you find it, there will be a future. If we find wisdom, brothers and sisters, Scripture tells us, there will be a future for us, and our hope will not be cut off. In our Old Testament reading this morning that Brooks read so clearly, Solomon asked the Lord for wisdom. Wisdom, I need to remind us at this point, is also another name for the Holy Spirit. Remember these words of John. This is Jesus speaking. But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. The Spirit of truth. Truth is wisdom. And we can't forget this. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will be the one who leads you. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. That's John 16, verse 13. In our Old Testament reading, before the Spirit of God was poured into the hearts of all who claimed Christ as Savior, the Holy Spirit came to particular people at particular times and particular places. And so that request from Solomon, I believe, actually takes the Lord by surprise. We had a discussion in Inklings, can we surprise the Lord? I think he actually might have been surprised when Solomon, who could have asked for any number of worldly things. He could have asked for riches, more riches. We're never satisfied with what we have. We have one iPad and one too. We have one nice car, we need a second one. We have one house, we need a beach house. He didn't ask for that. Could have asked for more power. He's the king of Israel. He could have asked to be king of the whole world. He could have asked for his enemies to have been taken out. He doesn't ask for that. He could have asked for more fame. I want more people to like me on Instagram. I want more people to notice me. I need more of man's approval. He doesn't ask for that. No, and I quote, give me an understanding mind to govern the people that I may discern, get ready, between good and evil. Whenever we hear those two words compounded in Scripture, wham! I mean, it ought to take us right back to the Garden of Eden. All the way back to God's words to Adam in the Garden. Genesis 2.16. Listen. And the Lord God commanded the man, Adam, saying, You may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. 
For in that day you eat it, you will surely die. Wisdom, the Holy Spirit, and the knowledge of good and evil. Hold those thoughts while I dip into the story about the person who came to my office. He came to my office with a struggle. This person had heard my sermon the week before, and he was struggling with a deep theological issue. He couldn't square Jesus' teaching in his life with his behavior or even with his will to do it. This person came because they had tried to muster in their own strength the will to do what Jesus commands to do, knowing it's a command, but frustrated they couldn't do it. And in this case, it was about forgiveness. In the sermon last week, if you heard it, you might remember that I read Matthew and quoted Jesus, who is pretty clear on this issue. To paraphrase it, or to put it in a charming southern vernacular, Jesus basically says, hey y'all, forgive. Afiti was the Greek word I said. Afiti, forgive. But this longtime Jesus follower could not seem to bring themselves to forgive. I loved their honesty. I think Jesus loved their honesty. So I started the conversation where I began my sermon this morning by asking the question, how does your moment of salvation walk itself out in your everyday life? And then we ended in a place of prayer. But in that prayer, we were reminded together by the Holy Spirit that thank God, Jesus has, is, and will do everything it takes to reconcile everyone to himself. And here's the kicker, Jesus never tires of reconciling never tires of reconciling. In spite of us, in spite of our inability at times to forgive, and most often without our help, Jesus is always reconciling and forgiving. Jesus is always calling his creation back to himself. Jesus is constantly forgiving, and by default, so is his Holy Spirit. This person that came to speak with me is not alone in their misunderstanding of the Christian life. Actually, I believe almost all followers at times fall into this trap. We think we're in charge, just like the Isaiah passage reminded us. We start operating from a place of self-will or self-desire. Our Inklings group is in a John Eldridge book right now. Eldridge understands deeply the Western work ethic and the get-the-job-done attitude that made this country so great. But at the same time, that attitude can lead us away from God and interfere with, listen to this, interfere with, the Holy Spirit's power in our life. I've met many well-intended confessing Christians who once they assent to those important words, believe in their hearts that Jesus has saved them from the power of sin and death, then they go through the rest of their life as if, well, now I'm on my own until Jesus returns or I die and go to heaven. I've said I believe and I'll cash that in sometime in the future. And over their Christian walk, brothers and sisters, they stop listening. They stop trusting. They put down their Bibles. They drop out of small groups. They drop out of church. They begin that slippery slope of trusting in only themselves. They lean on their own wisdom or understanding. I know that's funny if you know that verse of Scripture. God's Word says the opposite. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. Proverbs 3.5 we should never get in the habit of relying on our own wisdom for one simple reason. It's wrong. It's sin stain, and it will lead us away from God. In other words, what I was trying to get this person to see who came to speak to me was this. Accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior was just the beginning of their new life. Now, and according to Scripture, we can be called into service because he's given us the credentials we all need to serve him. The sign of the servant of God, our sign of peculiarity, is the leader within. The Holy Spirit, the leader within. He's like a uniform, you men and women in the, men and women in the service. He's like a uniform that we can't see. He's like a tattoo, young people, that's invisible. He has sealed us. And we are, here's a cool sidebar, now peculiar. Peculiar people, the King James Version of the Bible, means a people especially possessed by God and particularly prized by Him. So don't let that word peculiar throw you off. Don't think you have to paint your face for Jesus. Know that peculiar means we are especially possessed by God 
and particularly prized by him. The New Testament substitutes this word peculiar as own possession. We are God's own possession in the two places it's used. He has come to save and lead his own possession. He has come to bring us the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. He has brought us the very wisdom of God given to us, some of us, before we even asked. Let me end with this reminder for all of us who follow Jesus. The transactional event of our salvation does have a three-step importance. First, for the day that we repented and claimed Jesus as Lord and Savior. Second, where we're living right now, for the rest of our lives filled with his Holy Spirit. And finally, for eternity, where we will dwell in the very presence of true wisdom himself. Amen. Let us confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed found on page 127. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, life from life, true God from true God, begotten and not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us, for our salvation, he came down from heaven was incarnate with the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified in the Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world, saying, Hear our prayer. For the peace of the whole world, and for the well-being and unity of the people of God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. For Foley Beach, Archbishop of the Anglican Church in North America, Bishop Mark Lawrence, Fitz Allison, Bishop in Residence, Gary, our rector, and the Reverend Fred Oyango, and all the people of our parish diocese of Misano, South Kenya, and for all the clergy and the people of our diocese and congregation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, and for all who teach and disciple others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for their faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our nation, for those in authority, and for all in public service, especially Donald, our president, Henry, our governor, and our local officials. Lord, we pray especially for the protection of the men and women serving in our armed forces and all fire, law enforcement, EMS, and first responders. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity, especially for our parish prayer list, Olga Abbott, John Benson, Joyce Bourne, Lett Boyd, Susan Boyette, Jerry Duff, Ed Grant, Jack Grimes, Dale Hicks, Eliza Jagger, Ellen Lumpkin, Sharon Miller, Emily Mosley, Roger Maurer, Harold Ness, Pat Knopf, Joanne Sasser, Marilyn Sinclair, Pat Stalby, Joe and Sally Steen, Emily West, Mary Wall, Janet Williams, and Zella Wilt. And also for the friends and family of Prince George Church. For Alan, Betty, Bill, Billy, Chip, Cheryl, Christine, Cookie, Dale, Dean, Diana, Gary, Jackson, Jeff, Jeffrey, Jerry, Jonathan, 
Julian, Julia, Lee, Len, Lily, Mike, Miriam, Nick, Robert, Rupert, Steve, Sue, Susan, Tim, Tootie, and Virginia. And for all others whom we now name before God. And those whom we have forgotten, would you, O oh Lord, remember? Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who have departed this life in certain hope of the resurrection, especially in thanksgiving, let us pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh, most mighty and merciful God, in this time of grievous sickness, we flee to you for relief. Deliver us, we ask you, from our peril. Give strength and skill to all those who minister to the sick. Prosper the means used for their cure. And grant that, perceiving how frail and uncertain our life is, we may apply our hearts to that heavenly wisdom which leads to eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Increase, O oh God, the spirit of neighborliness among us that in peril we may uphold one another, in suffering tend to one another, and in homelessness, loneliness, or exile, befriend one another. Grant us brave and enduring hearts that we may strengthen one another until the disciples and the testing of these days are ended, and you again give us peace in our time. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. amen. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. The top of page 130. Most yes. merciful God, we, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him. Have mercy upon you all, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Please stand. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And with your spirit. Greet one another with a holy wave. God's peace. God's peace. An offertory sentence from 1 Peter. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light.
service continues on page 132 in the Book of Common Prayer. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. spirit. Lift up your hearts. We, we lift them up to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give Him thanks and praise. It is right, our duty and our joy, always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by His glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, 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 holy Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You may remain standing, kneel, or be seated. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself, and when we had sinned against you and become subject to evil and death, you and your mercy sent your only Son, Jesus Christ, into the world for our salvation. By the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, he became flesh and dwelt among us. In obedience to your will, he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself once for all, that by his suffering and death we might be saved. By his resurrection, he broke the bonds of death, trampling hell and Satan under his feet. As our great high priest, he ascended to your right hand in glory, that we might come with confidence before the throne of grace. On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks to you, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And we celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this pray, sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. We offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your word and the Holy Spirit to be for your people the body of your Son, Jesus Christ, and the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Sanctify us also that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament and be made one body with him that he may dwell in us and we in him. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ and bring us with all your saints into the joy of your heavenly kingdom where we shall see our Lord and Savior Jesus face to face. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the peace. Hallelujah. Join me in praying our prayer of humble access on the bottom of page 135. We do not presume to come to this year's table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your abundant and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose character is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may never work well in him, and he in us. Amen. Brothers and sisters, these are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ Jesus died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving. Amen. If you have your wafer at home, now is the time to consume it. This is the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. And this is the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. would be pleased to page 677 in the Book of Common Prayer and join me in saying prayer 106, the prayer for spiritual communion, page 677. Dear Jesus, I believe that you are truly present in the Holy Sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to possess you within my soul. And since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, I beseech you to come spiritually into my heart. I unite myself to you, together with all your faithful people, gathered around in every altar of your church. And I embrace you with all the affections of my soul, never permitting me to be separated from you. Amen. Join me now in praying our post-communion prayer, found on page 137 in the Book of Common Prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord, to him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, to the honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Now may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of God, and especially of His Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be upon you all, remain with you this day and forever. Amen. Amen.
peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia.